gracious God, we thank you that you are here. Because truly, if you were not, all that we do would be just theater. So open our hearts and our minds, Lord, to your presence. May we not just act, but receive. Work in our hearts, O Lord, and our minds that which you desire. And so we do say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's been a while since I've been here. It's great to be back. I've been looking forward to this morning, wrestling with and thinking particularly about what I should say. Um, <laughs> if you were looking for happy stories in the Bible, you wouldn't have found them in the readings this morning. There's some tough words, but I think words that speak to things that are important for us to listen to, pay attention, think about, and try to find a way to live. As many of you know, churches don't have particularly good reputations, and that's only increased since all of the divisions that are now taking place in the church about everything from COVID regulations to whether or not you believe that the election was stolen or that the January 6 attack on the Capitol was either a patriotic demonstration or an insurrection. Uh, and in fact, David Brooks wrote in the New York Times not too long ago, he called it a war within the church that is still waged in a way that literally def def breaks up families and causes people to mark each other as enemies. A leading uh, charismatic preacher by the name of Jeremiah Johnson wrote and published a letter not too long ago, and Brooks mentions this in his article, saying in essence that when the attack on the Capitol happened, he wound up actually writing a letter of apology to the people that had followed him for supporting that action. And he received God knows how many countless, uh, he said, I was cussed out, I was derided, I was, you know, I lost all these followers in a way that really surprised him because, of course, all the people who were responding to him were Christians. Certainly not exactly what the scripture says in the letter of James about being quick to listen, slow to speak. Man's anger does not honor the righteousness of God. And the kind of meek humility that is in fact asked of us, it seems to me a lot of what we're doing and what we have done shows the fact that all that we are do going through has exposed some fault lines inside of us that we did not know were there. I had a woman meet with me not too long ago who told me tearfully a story, and she had no idea that her husband had literally drained $32,000 out of their savings because of literally an online life that, he knew that she knew nothing about. And finally, it all came to light, and she is now in the position of trying to figure out how to salvage their marriage. The point was, she had no idea. These were both committed Christian believing people. And because of all of that, and I, I cannot tell you how many stories I hear, in fact, if I were to put, I've been a bishop now for 10 years, if I were to put all of the stories prior to the pandemic that I've heard about clergy spouse difficulties or wrestling with people who were leaders who are coming through some of the things that I described, and put them all together, it would not be half of what I've heard in the last 18 months since the pandemic. People are wrestling, it is hard, and they are discovering things about their life or even the life of their spouse that they did not believe was actually true. And because that's so, that gives the gospel reading a certain kind of contemporary application that it would not have prior to these things being exposed. You see, it feels esoteric, doesn't it, to us, this conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees about whether or not you should wash your hands before eating a meal and that that would be defiled if you did not do that? And why in the world would Mark and some of the other gospel writers include this in the narrative of the life of Jesus and give it so much space, literally, 
we've got almost half a chapter, which if you consider that Mark's gospel is only 16, that's a lot of airtime. And yet, the point of what Jesus is describing is incredibly current. What's he mean? What he's trying to say that is this to the Pharisees. Here's what's going on with you, Pharisees. What you do is that you require all of these outward actions, and you practice them to a T. But yet, what's really going on is that it's theater. You are acting these things out, but it is no indicator whatsoever of what's actually going on in their hearts. As he quotes Isaiah, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. In other words, when we come together here in the presence of God, or when you get alone and pray, what God is paying attention to, what matters most to God, is actually what's going on down inside of here. Regardless of what's happening in terms of your outward posture, regardless of what you sing or don't sing, what you say or do not say, it matters far less to God than what you're really saying in here. That matters more to him than anything. And why is that? Because, believe it or not, God loves and cares for you so profoundly and so deeply. He wants to hear your heart. He wants to know what you actually think, as opposed to creating a prayer that might fulfill an obligation, but certainly doesn't express what's inside of you. And there are plenty of people, in fact, who live with that kind of dichotomy. They show up in church, and they know all of the liturgical actions to a T. They always cross themselves the right way at the right time. They genuflect and all of those things, which if genuine ex expresses the faith of the heart, those are lovely. But if instead what's going on is that you're just trying to get through this, you really wish you weren't here, but maybe God might show up this morning, I don't know, and your brain is someplace else, then what you're doing is actually exacerbating a problem where you've split what's happening in your heart and what's going on outwardly. That's a problem. And that's a problem to God because you cannot build a relationship with anyone, God included, on pretense. That's why we begin the Eucharist almost always, not this morning because it's confirmation, with what's called the Collect for Purity. Almighty God to whom all hearts are, what? Open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. That defines the playing field. Where are we? We are actually in the presence of God who, like with x-ray vision, sees everything that's going on inside of us, notices every place our mind flits, every place our heart is inclined to go, even as we are sitting with dignity in the pew listening to the bishop's sermon. That's where we are. And God knows all of that. And so the question becomes, are you going to be willing to get real with God? To say actually what's on your heart? To pour out your heart before him, as the psalmist says, that allows you to express what is so deeply and deeply important inside of you in a way that, in fact, matters to God. That's what God wants. Otherwise, you're in a position of feeling very uncomfortable. Boy, I felt it. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle, abide upon your holy hill? This is the psalm that we did this morning. Whoever leads a blameless life and does what is right and who speaks the truth from his heart. Well, that leaves me out. Are you there? In other words, what we're doing this morning is that we're actually calling one another to a very different kind of life than a life that is based on pretense, a life that is placed on looking good. Now, I want you to know, I believe in courtesy. I believe in being kind to one another, even if you don't like them. 
That's a part of what folds us together, particularly in a society, society right now where we so deeply disagree. For many of us, courtesy is a thing of the past, and we really do treat even people who we call neighbors or parishioners with an astonishing level of disregard because they don't toe the line in the way that we think they should, politically or socially, should not be. So what I'm not calling about is calling for is a level of honesty where you have the right to be able to say whatever is inside of you to whomever. That's actually self-centeredness. My, my ability and my right to express my opinion is more important than your feelings. Not true. But what I am saying that as we gather together in the name of Jesus and before God, we should have the wondrous sense, because I think this is what God invites us into, the wondrous sense that we are before, as the colleague says, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts what the love of your name. In other words, clear aside the brokenness and the sin, the things that divide me from you and one another. Forgive me for the kind of unbridled way that my thoughts just fling with resentment and anger toward all kinds of people, even if I don't say it, in a way that certainly gives me the inability to be able to love and care. Work something new in me. Graft in our hearts the love of your name. Because what is St. James meant to be in the city of Ormond Beach? Is it not if we are the church meant to be, not a place where everybody agrees with one another, but instead a hospital where above all we care, we're kind, we make room for one another, we allow people to be themselves and figure out how we're going to live out this life especially in places where we don't agree or where we're not from the same background. So that what begins to be true in our midst is what Jesus said, by this shall all people know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's very different from only loving the people who believe or don't believe that the election was stolen. I would hope that those kinds of churches are the ones that make the headlines not those who are persecuting the people with whom they disagree. That is what we are actually being invited into, an opportunity to lay down our divisions, a commitment to say, I will, with God's help, to live in a way that is profoundly countercultural to this broken and divided life that we have inherited, particularly over these past 10 years. If anyone thinks they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their heart, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Family, it really comes down to this. Where are you going to give your energy? You only have so much of it. So if where your brain goes, where the news takes you, is in deep deeper places of frustration and resentment and helplessness over the things that you see on camera and a resentment against those who are perpetrating them. And that's where you're spending all of your energy and all of your time in a way that allows to actually infect your relationships with one another and you create tears of people with whom you like and don't like. And that's where all of your energy is going. You don't have any energy to care for orphans and widows. You don't have any, any energy to reach out to men and women in need because a part of what all of this is producing is an epidemic of brokenness, loneliness, financial disruption, and profound heartbreak. If there was ever a time where we need generous believing Christians who live with open hands and reach out to people in need it is now, and it will probably only get worse before it gets better. By this shall all people know that you are my disciples. God, may God work that inside of us. Did you ever think that somehow keeping yourself unstained from the world means limiting your time 
in front of the television so your heart doesn't get so wrapped up in all of the anger and the resentment that you hear? I mean, most people think to keep oneself unstained from the world has to do with morals. Yes, it does, but not the kind of select morals that the fundamentalists want to talk about. Don't drink, don't dance, don't chew, don't smoke with those who do. I heard that as a kid. No, it's much bigger than that. It's a life of compassion and generosity. A life of generosity in a way that makes room for people. A curiosity about wanting to build bridges and get to know people across differences and understand that your Christian commitment actually matters more, is more deeply important than any other place of division in your life. That's what these people are committing themselves to this morning. They're committing themselves, they say, I will, with God's help, to live a life that reflects the life and love of Jesus more than anything or anyone else. Honestly, to do less than that is to be disloyal to the very commitments that we will make this morning. It's not about taking a particular political posture. You can believe what you like. But the fact of the matter is, is that if it begins to develop and warp your character, then that's idolatry. That's a problem. Because the commitments that we make when we say, I believe, literally take precedent over everything else. That's what baptism means. That's what confirmation means. That you're coming into something, you are bending the knee literally to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And you're committing to love him, to follow him, and to walk with him wherever it is that he takes you. And out of that, to be an expression of his love to this broken world that we know so well. So, beloved, I would invite you, don't just sort of let the liturgy be theater. Wrestle with it, listen to it, ask God to help you with it. Work with the things that you don't understand. Go visit your clergy or others if there are places inside of you where there's this kind of discontinuity. Don't let this opportunity pass you by to know that God is inviting you to know something more about his love than what we presently know. You know, that's actually why I'm here. I'm here in the midst of what I will do in preaching and presiding and praying for these people and meeting you to learn something more about the love of Jesus than I presently know. A part of the humility that God works in your heart as you begin to know him is that you realize you don't don't know very much. In fact, in some ways, the sign of being learned is that you recognize that there is far more to know than you know now about any subject. And so that is the humility into which we are being invited as sons and daughters of God. So, beloved, may God work in us the very thing that we have prayed. Graft in our hearts the love of your name and increase in us true religion. May God work that in us, not only for our sake, but for the sake of men and women who would expect us to be hypocrites and instead, We're learning how to love. Amen.